promoting scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captain of a scientific technological elite. We signed a climate convention on the importance of economic instruments and free markets were included in this mammoth uh, Agenda 21 document and the Rio Declaration. Now, let me be clear on one fundamental point. Uh, the United States fully intends to be the world's preeminent leader in protecting the global environment. Coming up, Technocracy News. Greetings from Technocracy News and Trends. Patrick Wood here, the Editor-in-Chief of Technocracy News and Trends. Today we take two steps forward and one step backward. Every once in a while there's some good news. We need to capitalize on it when we see it. The first headline today concerns energy. Safe, mass-producible, truck size nuclear reactors have been designed and perfected, if you will, at the University of New Mexico. This is a revolutionary development, not the first of its kind, I might add. But in this case, this would have great promise for energy throughout the world because not only is the device safe, but it also can be mass-produced, transported on a truck safely to its destination, and hooked up. My comments on this are, this revolutionary miniaturization of nuclear power could solve the world's energy need in a few years, but it will most likely be demonized by the alternative energy Green New Deal crowd who are pushing sustainable development. This kind of invention simply does not fit into the controllable type of energy, which is represented by alternative energy these days. The article states, a new very small long life and modular reactor design has been developed at the University of New Mexico's Institute for Space and Nuclear Power Studies. It offers passive operation and decay heat removal and redundant control to make it walk away safe. During nominal operation and after shutdown, the VSLLIM reactor is cooled by natural circulation of an end vessel liquid sodium that is enabled using end vessel chimney and helically coiled tubes heat exchanger placed at the top of the downcomer. The reactor can generate between 1 and 10 megawatts per hour, depending on the height of the chimney and the hex design. Highlights of the SLIMM design are walk away passively safe, smaller than a shipping container, factory mass producible, narrow and small design could fit on rockets and space applications, that means it could go into space. As many as 10 to 30 units could be deployed incrementally at a single site, commensurate with the increase in electricity demand for a plant total electricity generation of up to 120 megawatts. These VSLLIM power plant modules could also be integrated into either a distributed or a central grid with renewable energy sources or operated alone. They can also provide both electricity and process heat for industrial uses and district heating. It also has two independent systems for safe passive removal of decay heat after shutdown and following an unlikely malfunction of in-vessel hex. These are liquid metal heat pipes embedded in the primary vessel wall and natural circulation of ambient air along the outer surface of the guard vessel wall. Well, just imagine what this could do for the third world, for instance, like places in Africa that have no energy at all, uh, and perhaps in other countries that just don't have access to a master grid. This could revolutionize energy throughout the world, and in a very short period of time. These reactors could be mass-produced in multiple continents at the same time. And if we wanted the world to be awash with energy, which is the central point, by the way, of all economic activity, this would fit the bill. What are the odds that this will be demonized by the alternative energy crowd who are intent on controlling all energy? Well, pretty high. There's been technology like this before that showed great promise. Many of them were fully tested in field trials, 
but they were subsequently spiked by those who had a greater vested interest in keeping things the way they are. This likely would be the case with this as well, but we can watch closely. And if the world ever decided that it really did want to give energy to people that don't have it, well, here's an answer. The next article has to do with Facebook. As you know, Facebook has been under great pressure globally for a number of reasons. They've received fines. They've received lawsuits. They've had a massive exodus of their own users. And Facebook has been punished to the point that it finally decided to give users control over whether its facial recognition option is available or not to you. New users coming into Facebook will have this option turned off. So when a picture of you pops up to somebody else, it will not put the little square box around your face and ask somebody else to tag you with, well, what's that guy's name or what's that woman's name? And once you are tagged, of course, then any other place your picture appears can be identified. And a lot of users complained about this. A lot of courts complained about it. The European Union complained about it. So it appears that Facebook has finally relented to the point of giving an opt-in, opt-out feature to its users so the user can decide whether or not it wants facial tagging and biometric identification of their face. The article states, Facebook on Tuesday said facial recognition technology applied to photos at the social network will be an opt-in feature. The change that began rolling out to users around the world came as the leading social network remains under pressure to better protect privacy and user data, including biometric information. Nearly two years ago, Facebook introduced a face recognition feature that went beyond suggesting friends to tag in pictures or videos, but could let users know when they were in images they had permission to see elsewhere on the service. Facebook is doing away with a tag suggestion setting in favor of an overall facial recognition setting, which will be turned off by default, according to a post by an artificial intelligence applied research researcher. Facebook's face recognition technology still does not recognize you to strangers. We don't share your face recognition information with third parties. We also don't sell our technology. People new to Facebook or who had the tag feature operating will get word from the social network about the face recognition setting, along with an easy way to turn it off or on as they wish. People will still be able to manually tag friends, but we won't suggest you to be tagged if you do not have face recognition turned on. Well, we'll see how true to this Facebook will remain. For now, they're pressured into backpedaling on facial recognition, and that's a good thing. It would be so easy, by the way, for Facebook to give users control over 100% of their data. They could do this in a heartbeat. It would be a cakewalk for a small team of programmers to set up a permissions page that allowed the user to completely control every byte of data that exists on him in the network. Of course, Facebook doesn't want to do this because it knows that people would use it and they would shut down the, all the data sharing that Facebook is able to do. This is what it monetizes, of course. This is how it makes its money. So it's simply just not going to allow it to happen. Maybe at some point, some court or some group of investors or somebody else will come in and put enough pressure on Facebook to where they'll finally relent and give control back to the people over the data that is rightfully theirs, I might add. The last story today is certainly the most disturbing story. This is not a good news story in any way, shape, or form. But it has to do with a new system called HARPA, H-A-R-P-A. -A. The headline is, HARPA, Social Credit Scoring for Gun Control? I wrote at the top in my comment section, the Trump administration has broken the ice on using social credit scoring technology to decide who is mentally stable enough to purchase a weapon. Similar to a no-fly list, a no-buy list, that is a no-buy list, would be based on AI analysis of social media posts and other easily gathered information about users in the public domain. The article starts out and says, the Trump administration is considering a proposal that would use Google, Amazon, and Apple to collect data on users who exhibit characteristics of mental illness that could lead to violent behavior. 
The Washington Post reported Thursday. The proposal is part of an initiative to create a Health Advanced Research Projects Agency, or HARPA, H-A-R-P-A, which would be located inside the Health and Human Services Department, the report notes, citing sources inside the administration. The new agency would have a separate budget, and the president would be responsible for appointing its director. HARPA would take after the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, which serves as the research arm for the Pentagon. The idea was first created in 2017, but has since gotten a renewed push after mass shootings killed 31 people in El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, Ohio in August. The Susan Wright Foundation approached the president recently and proposed the agency include a project called Stopping Aberrant Fatal Events by Helping Overcome Mental Extremes or Safe Home, the report notes, citing two people familiar with the matter. President Donald Trump has a close relationship with Bob Wright, who founded the foundation after his wife died of cancer. Wright was a former chair of NBC and occupied that position while the president hosted The Apprentice. Harpa would develop, quote, Breakthrough technologies with high specificity for early diagnosis of neuropsychiatric violence, according to a copy of the proposal. Quote, a multimodality solution along with real-time data analysis is needed to achieve such an accurate diagnosis. I will pause and say, who says it's accurate? They haven't even made it yet. So far... Everything that AI has attempted to do to analyze people or their personalities or any other characteristics has been proven to be demonstrably unreliable and inaccurate. So how the early political proponents of HARPA could make such a statement is unconscionable. The document lists several technologies that could be employed to help collect information, including Apple Watches, Amazon Echo, and Google Home. Jeffrey Ling, the lead scientific advisor on HARPA, told reporters Thursday the plan would require enormous amounts of data and scientific rigor. He added, quote, everybody would be a volunteer. We're not inventing new science here. We're analyzing it so we can develop new approaches. The White House declined to provide the Daily Caller News Foundation with a statement but sources told Washington Post that Trump has reacted very positively to the proposal. It is unclear if he has seen the safe home idea. Well, if the administration takes us any further than the simple talk that we have right now, this is a very disturbing development. China, of course, has perfected social credit scoring for not only individuals but businesses as well in China. If they don't like the way you behave, They simply will force you to behave that way by excluding you from the economic system. And if you want to get back into the mainstream of things, you simply will knuckle under and do what they want you to do and become a good little model citizen. Now, in this case, this is a very specific use of social credit scoring for mental health. But if a diagnosis is rendered from an artificial intelligence program, for whatever reason, that you are mentally unstable, and therefore not permitted to buy a weapon, according to your Second Amendment rights, of course, then you simply will be excluded from the system. You will be on the no-fly list for guns, except that it will really be the no-buy list. Many people have found out the hard way, by the way, that the TSA's no-fly list is almost impossible to get your name off of once you're on it. And if you were put on that list by mistake, well, it's just pretty much too bad for you. You may not see the inside of an airplane again for the rest of your life. But in this case, we do know that there are a number of factors that make artificial intelligence unreliable for an application like this. And it would be completely dystopian if the Trump administration allows us to move forward. This is also a slippery slope for many other types of social credit scoring that could be applied so easily. And once the door is open for this in gun control, you know it's going to be open for all kinds of other areas as well. If you are given a low score on any particular type of social credit scoring system, getting your name off that list or bumping your score up again will be virtually impossible. 
This is simply not something that we want to see in society. Not now, not in the future, not ever. We do not want to be like China. We do not want to be like Brave New World. We do not want to be like 1984. But this is exactly where it's headed. So I hope that you can take note and also take action to let everybody in your community, everybody in your state, and everybody that you know in Washington, D.C., back off. Don't do this. This is wrong. It's inaccurate. It's unfair. We simply don't want to go down this road. If you have not had exposure to citizensforfreespeech.org yet, I would encourage you to go to that website even now and put your name on the list to be part of our movement to rediscover the First Amendment and the value of free speech in our nation. You know we're under heavy attack on all sides. The First Amendment is about to crumble for a number of reasons. And if we lose the right to speak and the right to redress the government for grievances and the right to assemble together, we've pretty much lost everything. On October 12, 2019, CFFS is sponsoring a one-day Phoenix fly-in for leaders who are involved in local activism around the country. And you can find a link to the RSVP page by going to citizensforfreespeech.org and just looking for the red button at the top of the screen. The page says, you know the issues, now find out what you can do to make things right. And join us for this intensive one-day meeting to discuss proven strategies and new developments in the fight to restore our communities across America. Bring your own issues that you care about and learn from the experts on how to get and stay on the winning side. This is a leadership meeting for members and friends of Citizens for Free Speech. That would include you, by the way. Members are encouraged to invite friends who are interested in pushing back on destructive policies that are plaguing our nation. The fly-in will be limited to 100 people. Each of our nationally known presenters will share concrete strategies that they have already found to be successful, and there will be lots of interaction. Now, this event will take place on Saturday, October 12, 2019, in Phoenix, Arizona, at the Doubletree Hilton Inn in Tempe, Arizona. It's only eight minutes from the airport, and they have 24-7 shuttle service to and from the airport. The cost will be $115 per attendee. That basically just covers the cost of the hotel and the refreshments and stuff we need to keep everybody standing. And the people who are going to be attending as resources are myself, of course, Tom DeWeese, president of the American Policy Center, will be representing the, generally the area of property rights. Matt Shea, representative from Washington State. Matt is an arch constitutionalist, a tremendous activist, and a great legislator. Mary Baker, the author of Citizen Ninja, Stand Up to Power, will be a resource for interpersonal relations and training. And Alex Newman, an internationally known journalist and education expert, will be addressing some of the things that he has seen around the country on people who have successfully fought back in their own communities. One very exciting thing I want you to know about is that we have discovered some legal strategies that will revolutionize how we approach our own local representatives on accountability. I'm not going to explain what it is on this very public podcast, but I want you to know that if you attend this meeting, you will learn firsthand, in depth, and in detail on how it works and how you might be able to implement it in your own community. So if you have a desire to come, please head over right away to citizensforfreespeech.org. Get your ticket. It's $115 per attendee. RSVP. Make your travel plans. There's a block of rooms available at the Doubletree Inn that you can get a discounted rate on. Rates are not horribly expensive anyway at that time of year in Phoenix. And we'll see you there. We hope to make some history with this meeting. Only time will tell, but your presence could be important. So I hope to see you there. Well, I'm Patrick Wood for Technocracy News and Trends. See you next time. Mm-hmm.